Welcome, everyone, to another Mod Spotlight. This time we're taking a look at Hearts of Iron 4, The Rise of Russia, uh, which is a mod that isn't out yet, and uh, it's been kindly given to me by, I believe, one of the developers. I don't fucking know. <laughs> but it's a Russian mod, so it's probably why you haven't heard of it. And as you can see, there's some interesting people in here. So as you can see, Yanin, uh, Kolchak, this is Anton Yenikin, who's a, you know, Russian army officer. Very important. Or sorry, not Antoniki, he's uh, Lav Karnilov. Uh, might know him from. Well, uh, there's a bit of him in Kaiserreich, but not much. Uh, and then there is uh, Kerensky over here, but he's actually kind of obstructed by Paradox. Uh, and as you can see, the mod is. Well, I'm, I'm playing the game in Russian. Because. Um, I believe the mod isn't localized in English. Now, I haven't actually loaded up the mod in English, but it probably isn't localized uh, because it is developed by Russian people and uh, all the screenshots are in Russian. And uh, yeah, that's. And they have a VK page. VK is like the Russian Facebook that I'll link. And uh, they have a Discord that I'll link if I remember. Uh, and if I don't, tell me. So as you can see, there's two start dates. Uh, one is 1st of January 1917, as you can probably gather and the other is 8th of november 1917 which is exactly the day after the uh, assault on the winter palace um october revolution actually happened in november uh so here this is stavai russia uh, rise up russia so you know rise of russia uh and this one is the russian experiment like field of experiments um now i believe that the they, they, like the, the mod is focused on the Russian Civil War, as you may gather, um, and um, um, yeah, let's check out first the first uh, the first little scenario. So this is obviously when World War One is still going on. The Tsar and the Tsarist government, the Empire, is still around. The Russians are desperately trying to hold the Germans as their armies have uh, been overextended by the Brusilov Offensive of 1916, uh, which despite having uh, success and all, managed to um, managed to push back the Austro-Hungarians a bunch, but at some point the Germans managed to uh, sort of save the Austro-Hungarians at the last possible moment and counterattack and retake Western Ukraine once again. Uh, for the Austro-Hungarians, and uh, in the north, uh, both Poland and uh, La uh, sorry, Lithuania have been completely taken over by Germans, and the Germans are at the gates of Riga. So basically, um, what happens is that the Russian Empire is doomed at this point, because there's a bunch of things that are going wrong. There is the land question, so that's the peasants that are requiring, um, that are requiring more and more rights and, you know, uh, the right to use their own land uh, and not have it, you know, under the control of um, big landowners that exploit them and stuff. There's uh, obviously a very high level of uh, illiteracy. There is hyperinflation. Uh, there is a transport uh, sort of issue, like the transport network is overloaded, outdated, and badly run. There is fraternization at the front, so uh, Russian and German soldiers at this moment in the war, especially because the Russians were uh, just really, really tired of the war, they were starting to essentially, instead of fight, just meet up and, uh, you know, do whatever, drink vodka and stuff. Um, and so that obviously is bad for the war effort, uh, both for Germany and Russia. Now, this was in part actually, well, in large part actually encouraged by uh, sort of left-wing subversives. So, yeah, uh, that was essentially one of the ways in which the army was started to become, well, useless for the Russian state. And this is the last national spirit, this Razlazhenia army. So it's the dissolve, like, um, dissolution of the army, essentially. Um, like, the decomposition, this Brigation. So at this point, the army is just on a route. Um, so you can see down the little description is fraternization, de um, desertion, self, um, you know, like uh, r uh, leaving positions without orders, um, and 
what is that? I do not know what that means, but then, um, you know, um, rationing, food rationing, the blah, 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 blah. It's all, um, it's all sort of uh, affecting badly the, um, in this moment, it's affect, it's, you know, affecting negatively the uh, structure of our army. And that just fucks up your army. As you can probably gather, those are malices to your army. So minus 10% organization, minus 5% um, recruitable population, minus 1.2% mobilization speed, or no, um, division recovery rate, uh, minus 10% attack, minus 5% defense, plus 2%. Urovin Abuchenia. What the hell is that? Minimalni Urovin Abuchenia. Um, must be something with experience. Yeah, probably like minimal training level because Abuchenia must be something like uh, learning or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, then this one decreases attack against Germany by 30%, and also for the Germans it decreases attack with you by 30% as well. Transport difficulties um, reduces division speed by 10%, effectiveness of uh, resource extraction by uh, 20%, uh, population, yeah, um, population recruitment, um, Like, uh, population recruitment by minus 20%. You can see over here, transport nie zatrudnienia. Uh, then minus plus 7.5% um, winter attrition. Plus minus 15% maximum uh, production cap. And then minus 1% papalnienia. Skurasti papalnienia. I do not know what that means, so let me look it up. It is apparently replenishment. Okay. Oh yeah, right. Palnienia, uh, right. Polna means full. Gipir inflatia, hyperinflation, five percent consumer consumer goods factories and minus five percent um, production uh, efficiency. And then, uh, well, bad uh, literacy is plus ten percent division training time, minus ten percent base production efficiency. Minus 10% uh, research speed, plus 100% ideology drift defense, and my, uh, plus 2% minimal training, whatever that is. And then the land question is uh, plus 20% to division recruitment, um, or sorry, to division training speed. I'm guessing because like, the peasant guy doesn't want to leave his farm. Um, minus 10% um, recruitable population. 5% um, what's that called? Consumer goods factories, minus 15% war support, and that plus 2% division training thing. Now, the mod also changes around laws, as you may um, remember some mods doing. Uh, now, this is actually kind of relatively cool because the government looks cool. <laughs> and uh, there's a bunch of different ministers, as you can see. Um, that have this really, really nice little portrait system. So there is the head of state, or sorry, head of government. The head of state obviously is over here. He's right now the emperor. Um, Minister Inostranik Diel, so that's the Minister of Foreign Relations. Uh, then we have the Minister of the Economy. Then the Minister of Internal Affairs. Then the Minister of Justice. And the political advisor, but apparently those don't exist yet. Uh, so, the uh, Minister of Justice over here seems like he does stability and support for various parties, and um, apparently decryption as well. Uh, then you have the, obviously, interior guy who, you know, supports a party and, uh, you know, um, does things like partisan stability. Uh, and uh, consumer goods. Then you have the economy minister, who obviously deals with production. Uh, and uh, hmm. hello, Felix Dzierżynski. Dier this guy's important. Uh, then you have the uh, foreign minister. I wonder if he does like anything. Like, obviously, he um, 
he seems to give ideology bonuses. Oh, hello, Alexandra Kolantai. Um, and then, oh, okay, so apparently some people decryption, and then, like, obviously, you know, all the ideology, you know, diplomacy things. Probably someone decreases the amount of time you require to make focuses. And uh, it actually uh, modifies the AI as well. Uh, so, for example, if you if the AI Soviet Union would have Molotov as a foreign minister, glorious Molotov, uh, he's going to have minus twenty five percent wish to um, wish to you know continue on with peaceful means. Uh, then uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, then the so like the government uh, leader. Yeah, just you know stability. You know, uh, construction speed, all these things. But look, that's uh, Chaitza. He is a uh, Menshevik. And he's a Georgian Menshevik as well. Yeah, we're gonna get to it because the mod is obviously focused on uh, the Russian Civil War now. Um, this is still a very, very early on beta stage, you will see, but. Or maybe alpha. It's actually not released. But the um, Russian Civil War scenario is represented pretty damn good. Especially, um, I actually like playing through. But yet, uh, and as you can hear, the voices are different, and yeah, they're they're like from various different games where Russian soldiers are dubbing. Uh, yeah, like for example, there's also voices from um, Men of War and Company of Heroes as well that I recognize, but. Whatever. Um, it's actually kind of nice to play through as like the Russian Empire just, just sort of disintegrating. You have a focus tree, uh, but it doesn't really matter because it's the first of January 1917. Now, if you may, if you kind of know something about the Russian history in 1917, you know that there's a February Revolution, which is actually in March. But you know, in early March, shit goes bad, and uh, yeah, this focus tree doesn't really. I don't think do anything, but you have a little economy part um, that's either just more hardline to get more uh, get more war production or uh, regulations, and then at the end is "Прекасывай вам работать, Scott," which means, um, well, uh, I, I I order you to work, scum. Interesting uh, or. Well, literally, it would be like uh, cattle, but you know, um, it's also used to like say you're scum, you know. Uh, so yeah, uh, fun times. So yeah, that increase that gets war economy, whatever. Uh, then in the political tree for the Tsarism, you'd have either uh, theocratic socialism, social monarchism, okay, obviously, uh, constitution like a limited constitution. Um, and the continuation of Stalipin's agricultural reforms, Prussian constitutionalism, or ultra um, right-wing coup. Uh, then, just you know, progressives. So you either have the Aktyabristi, the Octoberists, who are conservatives, or the Kadieti, the constitutional, Demo constitutional Democrats, who are liberals. And uh, you have a parliamentary uh, democracy. Then you have uh, the uh, like dissolving the Duma, which is the parliament, and you can either go with um, the autocracy uh, by a purge in the capital, purges in the capital, obviously, or Chornaya Sotnya, who are the Black Hundreds, who were like these kind of weird paramilitaries that um, that supported autocracy, monarchy, and uh, you know the Orthodox Church, uh, anti-Semitism. A bunch of fun people that emerged out of 1905, and uh, apparently, if uh, yeah, you can like have Nikolai II um, abdicate, and then power either goes to Tsar Alexei, who is the son, or the regency of Alexandra Fyodorovna, who I'm guessing is the Tsarina, the you know wife of this. Guy, because at the end there's like the cult of Saint Grigory Rasputin, who uh, was 
well, a lot of people rumor a lover of the Tsarina. So, you know, literally this guy's a cuck, apparently. But, yeah, that's, that's like, this is all, like, the Tsar's wet dream, and uh, it's only his fantasy. It's not actually reality. Now, other countries, we're just going to quickly go over them. They don't really have that many focuses. There is a little bit of a, like, early, early, early version of a German focus dream. Strike auf den Bolschewismus! Obviously. Um, like, a few of these involve things that can't happen yet, such as supporting the uh, the White Army in the south of Russia, obviously. So there's no effects. Uh, but there's also other things that... Uh, apparently, like, the support for an anti-British... Um, an anti-British rising in Ireland... Then there is support for the White Finns, which obviously can't happen yet because right now the Russian Empire is still all together. So the Finns are a puppet. Then there's like these two little tiny puppets down here, Bukhara and uh, Hiva, who are like these weird autonomous little, you know, nobilities that still exist within the Russian Empire. But this is all Russia. Uh, and Russia still has parts of Manchuria, the Chinese Eastern Railway, which is actually modeled by like these, yeah, as you can see, KVZD, this means Kitaiskova Vastochnova Zhileznaya Daroga, or Kitaiskova Vastochnova Zhileznaya Daroga, Kitaiskova Vastochnova Zhileznaya Daroga, Kitaiskova Vastochnova Zhileznaya Daroga, Jesus Christ, uh, the Chinese Eastern Railway, and, uh, you know, you've got the different stretches, um, and parts of Manchuria, but bad things can happen. You can imagine why. And Mongolia is still, you know, independent with the Bokht Khan. And there's, you know, a bit of Chinese Civil War action going on. Not yet, but, you know, a bit of warlord clicks. You know, I don't think that they, like, do anything. Uh, they're all military governments, which is a kind of puppet of uh, the Chinese Republic over here. Under Li Yuanhong, who I believe was a guy that managed to, like, buy the position of president, or that might have been Cao Kun, I don't remember, I don't know, whatever, it's not actually that important, but I'm gonna look it up because it's kind of funny if it's that guy, if it is actually that guy. Hmm. Apparently, uh, apparently he had like a political marriage with Yan Shikai. Interesting. I don't know. Um, China's not the point of the mod. <laughs> So whatever. If you want to play China, go play the... Oh, shit. That doesn't exist anymore. The Warlord mod. Fucking rip. Press F. Um, then there's the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but their focuses don't do anything, and they're all, you know, normal and uh, work in progress. And then uh, France, like, obviously all work in progress. And then I believe Britain just has the generic one. Yeah, it's got the generic one, and uh, everyone else has, like, the generic one. Except when certain little things rise up. Let's see when things rise up. Uh, huh, look at that. Uh, so actually, Finland, once you have um, the Declaration of Independence, has their own little focus tree. So that's, that's kind of cool. So now I'm going to load a few saves that I have to show sort of the descent into madness of Russia. Now, this is going to take a little while because my computer is slow, and I don't want to edit because I am a little um i am a little bitch who is just very 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 lazy so if you want to skip this just go ahead uh but as you can see there's also like this cool art style that's uh that's going on all the loading screens are actually kind of done well no no of course you have some of the regular games but all the new ones are actually kind of made in this like cool little yeah, art style that's boy. sort of like, trying to be, like, a painting kind of thing. I don't know. Um, so here we are in uh, the 1st of March, 1917. You've got the event where shit starts to go wrong. So this is the Tsar's uh, tour at the front. At the, at the Sorry, at the headquarters. Um, so right now, even though everyone's telling him 
yo, might not be the best idea because Petrograd, the public order, blah, blah, blah. He's going to go visit um, the, chief of gen the chief of the general staff. Um, and, um, uh, like, yeah, as you can see, plus 200 uh, little command points and all that kind of stuff. This is the will of the, of the sovereign. So we go further on and uh, bad things will start happening. This is the 2nd of March, 1917. The February Revolution happens after the 8th of March. Now, at the 8th of March, as you can see, uh, uh, all the while the war is still going to be going on. Uh, and we're trying to dissolve the Duma because I just decided to be a dick. Um, now, the 8th of March was when like the spark for the uh, February Revolution kind of exploded because it's International Women's Day, which used to be a big, um, actually, socialist sort of, um, not celebration, but day of protest of working women. And as you can see, we get Masovia Demonstrazi, so mass protests, uh, anti-war meetings uh, in the, you know, uh, in the occasion of the day of the working woman started to um, be held, or sorry, started to turn into mass um, strikes and demonstrations. Um, production was stopped by uh, the working women of the um, Tarshilovsky uh, sort of weaving mill, the um, sort of a grenade or um, munitions, right, munitions factory, Stari Pari. Par Parviani, Parvianian, uh, sounds like a Finnish name. Um, participants at the meeting um, from the uh, from the Viborg, uh, sort of uh, this would be like a road that goes by um, seaside or uh, or a river bank. I'm not sure if there's a word for that in English, but whatever. Actually, no, that's uh, let's see, is there waterfront? Right, correct. Um, and they headed to the center of Petrograd. Petrograd is um, the name that they gave to St. Petersburg in wartime uh, because St. Petersburg was deemed to be too German. Uh, obviously because the guy who named St. Petersburg Peter the Great uh, named it for St. Peter, but also kind of he liked himself. Although he was legitimately like a great ruler, he also was kind of a fanboy of Germanics. So, you know, Germany, Holland, um, well, at the time, the United Provinces, I believe, the Republic of the United Provinces, um, Sweden. He liked those countries, and so he started to name things, you know, in uh, in, G in German. So it's like Kronstadt as well, like Stadt. That's German. Kronstadt, the city of the crown. That's, uh, I believe, from Finnish. Um... Or not Finnish, fuck. Uh, Swedish, because the Swedish used to control Finland and have this fortress. And he's like, whatever, that's a good name. Uh, then, you know, let's name something after Peter. Yeah, Sankt Petersburg, uh, which today is still the name of uh, St. Petersburg. In English, it's translated. In Russian, it's just Sankt Petersburg, which is literally from German. Anyway, that trivia aside. So blah, 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 a bunch of things happen. A bunch of factories join in. Stary Yesner, Novi Yesner, Ivaz, Ericsson, or Ericsson, uh, Ruski Reno, Russian Reno, uh, Rosenkrantz, Phoenix, Promet, Prometheus. Uh, then a bunch of uh, a bunch of people from random uh, St. Petersburg districts and uh, neighborhoods come in. All together, 128,000 people. The columns of demonstrators went uh, uh, sort of shouting the um, shouting the slogans "Down with war, down with autocracy, uh, ble bread," <laughs> which was obviously the best slogan ever. Um, and uh, the Okhrana, which is the Tsarist secret police, came in and um, started to sort of break up everything. Uh, then there were clashes. Then blah, 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 a bunch of shit's going on. The troops are called in uh, by the garrison commander, but they refuse to fire on the crowd and um, sort of, um, like, this turns into a general sort of riot from just strikes and anti-war, it becomes anti-government. And the troops start to 
you know, turn in favor of the revolution. Mietija uh, Varmi, or Mietiji, sorry, which is like uh, uprisings in the army. Essentially, um, like at this point, uh, you know, you get different choices to deal with that. Uh, so the first one is we can't do anything about this. Um, the second one is. Um, um, so basically, um, like try to dissolve the uh, rebellious, um, mutinous uh, uh, sort of units, or um, just you know, uh, celeb like uh, perform patriotic speeches in front of the in front of the mutineers, which is like. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, which is uh, actually this uh, looks a lot like uh, this looks a lot like the mutinies event from Normal Hearts of Iron. Cool, interesting. Uh, but whatever. Um, and at the end, it's glorious because Bunim Sledjitsa situatse. We will follow the situation. Literally, the capital is occupied by angry, striking women, fucking incensed, uh, hungry workers, and. Right, rebellious soldiers and the you know uh like at this point after this 8th of march the pro-tsarist forces in petrograd that are left are essentially just cossacks um who were seen for a long long time actually in russian history as like the sort of gendarmerie of tsarism of, of autocracy they were you know the most solid defenders or whatever but you know that was kind of not entirely correct, as it is shown by the fact that a lot of the times they actually revolted. And in this case, they end up switching sides as well. And then there were the, you know, military police, secret police, the Akhrana, all that kind of stuff. And then there were the cadets of, like, you know, military academies, all that stuff, who were obviously, you know, incensed with patriotic ideology and uh, pro, uh, pro-monarchy. Because these guys were mostly arist aristocrats, so obviously they supported the... Um, they supported the monarchy. So the event, we got it a little bit earlier than 8th of March, but it's fine, whatever. Um, and uh, after this, you get more and more events. So we also get the crisis of the mutinies, um, which we need to resolve in a bit to get the, uh, get the army back in order. But bad things are already happening, essentially. Um, so why don't we take the moment to check out other things. So there's economic laws. Uh, this is um, land property, mm, sort of a land property structure. Then there's uh, control over the economy by, by the government. And then there's um, sort of labor legislation and obviously the trade laws. Now, these things are obviously the same um, down here, the little research things, and then the leaders of um, the army, the navy, all that. It's just normal, except with the cool portraits. Um, I'm going to show that later because we have more things. Armed uprising. Um, so after, uh, after the mutiny, uh, the sort of uh, security battalions, 600 people um, under the command of uh, Starshim Munterov, so like the sort of senior uh, junior officer, which doesn't sound that great in English. Uh, the soldiers uh, shot their commander. Uh, they, went, they went on to arrest um, Gaup? What the hell is that word? I need to... Gaupt Hvati. Probably deputies or something. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. Gaupt Vati. It's probably some weird word from German. Um, they started to um, they started to you know uh, spread this to uh, units that were nearby to neighboring units, uh, and uh, they also 
started to, you know, unite with the uprising. A part of the officers uh, just ran away, and others were killed. Then um, the armed soldiers went into Yetanamu uh, Prospectu, uh, the Yetan Yetanamu, uh, probably Yetani, whatever the fuck he's supposed to be, um, Boulevard, and uh, they uh, met up with. Um, you know, striking workers of uh, uh, of Petrograd uh, we weapons and munitions factories. From many prisons, uh, prisoners were, you know, freed and uh, released because the prisons were stormed and uh, blah, blah, blah. A bunch of shit happens. Essentially, um, at this point, they, uh, they, along with a bunch of uh, opposition politicians, occupied the Tarid Palace, which is one of the palaces of uh, Petrograd. And in there... Uh, essentially, um, they form a new state, Duma, um, and uh, because that the um, the Duma, the Russian Parliament, sort of gathered in the Tarid Palace, and from that, essentially, you know, a bunch of shit happens. Then a government is formed after a few days. Uh, at the same time, however, the workers who had gone in to sort of pressure the Duma to sort of um, given to their demands, also started to form the workers' soviets, uh, the councils of, you know, the soldiers and the workers and all that stuff. Uh, so there you see all the politicians that are involved. I'm not going to, you know, go down and uh, slowly and painfully try to understand everything that's going on and translate it. Uh, but essentially, yeah, just um, in Petrograd, the revolution has triumphed. Um, in, at the front, there is still is um, an army that's, you know, multiple million men strong, and uh, the destiny of the monarchy now uh, is in the hands of the um, commanders of the Northern Front, because, well, because the monarchy um, is uh, obviously, you know, uh, Tsar Nikolai II is heading towards the front, so he's right now on a train moving south, and... Um, Essentially, uh, at this point in uh, in our history, what happens is that essentially the army high command is like, well, and actually a lot of his uh, family members, other you know uh, members of the royal family, are like, okay, you need to abdicate because the situation is completely out of control. Now, um, let us go a little bit further. And uh, check out the because the the February Revolution right now is ongoing. Check out when um, the provisional government is formed. Last time it was the 27th of March for me, so let's just jump quickly ahead. I think it's gonna be faster for me to go through like this. As you can see, some nice Russian soldiers lining up in the streets in a really cool little art. Revolutionary soldiers. There we go. So, we still have uh, Nikolai II, but we get two important events. The end of the monarchy. So this explains everything that's going on. So essentially, the revolution began as a, um, you know, sort of spontaneous uh, outpouring of the, of the, you know, masses of the, peop of the people in general. Um, protesting against... Um, against the uh, war rationing, making meetings against the war, uh, demonstrations, blah, blah, blah. Um, strikes in, um, in uh, productive enterprises, in cities, blah, 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 blah. It turned into a uh, armed uprising. The troops um, went over to the side of the, um, of the you know, uh, of the revolutionaries. And uh, they occupied the sort of main strategic points of the city of Petrograd, um, the government buildings, and um, you know, uh, in all important aspects, the um, uh, the Tsar's government was unable to take any decisive uh, and quick action to stop this. 
then blah blah blah, a bunch of other shit happens. Uh, temporary committee uh, of the state Duma of the parliament uh, decided that uh, it would take power in its own hands, and that would eventually become the uh, sort of um, provisional government. Uh, and in the night of that day, um, the, the um, like the um, the garrison of Tsarskoye. Uh, Tsarskoye Silo, which is a little town south of Petrograd, uh, also went over to the side of the revolution. Uh, today, this city, this little town actually, or at, at this point it would just be a suburb of uh, Petersburg, is actually called Pushkin, uh, I believe. Maybe they rechanged the name, but yeah, I think it's called Pushkin, because that's where Pushkin, the famous Russian writer, is from. Anyway, uh, just a bunch of bad shit happens for Nikolai II. Uh, then there's a bunch of people that talk to each other and are like, oh shit, we need to find a solution to this and restore order. Then um, the all of the commanding um, officers of the front and uh, also the uh, great prince, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Grand Duke, <laughs> because Knyaz, this thing can mean both prince and duke. Uh, the Grand uh, Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, who is another... Uh, sort of Romanov guy, um, and used to be, I believe, the commander of the whole army in like 1915, but I can't remember exactly. Um, in their response telegrams, uh, asked uh, the Tsar, because the Tsar had like sent a telegram because he was at this point just kind of stuck on a random rail station, I don't remember exactly where, because the troops there wouldn't let him go through because they were on the side of uh, the rebels. And um, he's, he sent a telegram to the army high command saying like, hey, shit's going on, fix it. And their response is um, uh, asking the Tsar to uh, g give up the throne uh, in name of the unity of the country and um, of the terrible times of war. So essentially to save the country. Um, for example, Counter Admiral, or yeah, Contra Admiral, uh, I guess that would be a rear, ad rear admiral. Uh, A.V. Kolchak uh, didn't even send a reply. Uh, so he's like, you know, yeah, he's he's a nice guy. Um, Jesus Christ. Blah, blah, blah. Bad shit happens. At this point, um, power is effectively in the hands of the uh, Pietro Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet. Uh, again, the revolutionary organ of... Uh, you know, the workers and the Petrograd garrison with self-elected deputies and the Vremini Komitet Gospodarstvenoi Dumi, so the temporary committee of the state Duma, which eventually becomes the provisional government. And then the other thing that happens is the Prikaz Nomer Adin, the order number one, which is what the Soviet um, issues, and it's got a few points. Essentially, um, does it actually list them? It actually doesn't seem to list them, but essentially, the main spirit of uh, Order Number One is: okay, we like gave power to the State Duma, but we don't really like trust them all that much because these people were collaborating with the Tsarism. So, essentially, um, they're like: okay, so we need to make sure that the army is not gonna be uh, sort of still in the state of just you know, terrible, uh, you know, um, terrible, like, autocracy and uh, just, you know, discipline uh, at the same, like, the you know, draconian discipline of uh, Tsarist chimes. So, essentially, uh, there were things like the officer can't disrespect the soldier. If, um, if there's, like, shipments of weapons, they all have to be approved by the Soviets. All units need to elect their own uh, representatives. Um... Sort of like a trade union, almost. Uh, so we get that national spirit, order number one. And it's obviously bad for our army because, you know, this is the soldiers essentially being like, we don't want to be sent into into the slaughter without, you know, approval. And generally, they don't want to be sent to the slaughter. So that's that. And uh, this is like the beginning of the end. Then we have a couple more interesting events. Um that happen a couple more interesting events 
Uh, so, yeah, we have that, we have that. Uh, we have the April Thesis, but uh, whatever. It's not that important. So, at this point, uh, the revolution was a democratic one. It was supported by various ultra-left forces, especially uh, the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries who had been fighting against Tsarism. The Bolsheviks were also involved, heavily. However, they were kind of without leadership and they were following everyone else. Uh, although locally they did take leadership. For example, in those worker strikes, it, they were, the, there was the deep involvement of a lot of actual Bolshevik activists and whatever. But in terms of like the overall leadership, they hadn't kind of made up their mind yet on what to do. Lenin was in Switzerland in exile, and he be he was you know the main leader of uh, of the you know Bolshevik party. At this moment, though, the Bolshevik Central Committee was on the side of uh, sort of supporting the provisional government and uh, continuing the war. Essentially, it was the same as the Menshevik position, which was to uh, ally with democratic forces because the Russian proletariat was not strong enough to, you know, make the revolution on its own, uh, or at least so they fought, and um, continue the war to defend the progress that had already been made in destroying uh, sort of dict dictatorial autocracy, tsarism, and that stuff. Uh, then Yenin comes in back with the train, all that, you know, story, and he's like, you guys are a bunch of idiots, we need to fight against the war, we need to stop this war, and that's gonna give us the popularity with the masses, because everyone fucking hates the war, to, you know, take over the government, which is effectively what happens. Now, I'm not sure why I, uh, why I have this thing, but certainly it's not that interesting. Let's go, um, let's go see what's going on over here. Um... I'm sure it was certainly an important event on whatever June 1917 that I made a bookmark for that, but um, no, nah, I guess I don't care. Um, some nice revolutionaries posing for pictures. Okay, uh, so at this point, this is 29th of July 1917. Uh, the provisional government has taken over, led by Georgi Lvov. Now, this is partially, uh, partially because we took the... Um, we took the uh, cadet uh, and Octoberist government focus because now we have a new focus stream. Um, as you can see, this has two branches. One of them is called Vidimenoye Pravitiosva, the provisional government. The other one is called General Karnilov. Uh, now, Karnilov is one of the generals of the uh, Russian army, as you can see, Lavr Karnilov, and in uh, August, in real life, he led a kind of half-coup attempt, yeah, well, full-on coup attempt against the other Russian government, because the first one was Lvov, the second one was Yovaya Kailitsya, so actually that's, um, actually, let's see if this one Let's just, yeah, okay, so the second Russian government after the fall of the Lvov government, um, which in here for some reason can't happen, it's just, um, sorry, it's just once you take one, once you take the first government, you can't take the second one, but whatever. Um, this one was um, a government of the SRs, which were considered a very, very far left force at the time. Uh, in practice, they didn't really, you know, do it that much, at least the right wing. The left wing of the SRs is another mess, and uh, you could probably uh, just, you can, if you don't understand anything about these Russian political parties or whatever, uh, either look them up, or there, there's actually a video on my channel on uh, the politics of Russia in Kaiserreich, which is a mod that's alternate history, but keeps essentially the same um, uh, political parties as real life Russia in the 1910s. So, yeah, that's gonna give you all the information that you need. Uh, now we get this glorious two events. So, there's a big demonstration, and we're gonna send the Cossacks and the cadets to murder them. Uh, but then there's also the Pirvi Universal, which is the declaration of uh, sovereignty of the Ukrainian Rada, Ukrainian Central Rada, which is the Ukrainian parliament in Kiev, 
and um, they addressed this sort of uh, declaration to Ukraine and the peoples of Ukraine, and they're like, we want autonomy from Russia. We don't want to separate from Russia. Was, this wasn't like completely separatist yet. They uh, sort of styled themselves as organs of the, uh, of the provisional government, but they wanted more autonomy. So we can either, at this point, we can either budem sledit za situacie, so we will follow the situation, just a, you know, glorious answer to everything, or da zdravstvuje svobodna Ukraina. So long live the independent Ukraine, and that, you know, makes us play as Ukraine, which for now, though, is still only a puppet of Russia, and as you can see, they only get Kiev at this first event, but there's a couple more events that will enlarge in Ukraine. At the beginning, they are led by a guy called Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, or Khrushchevsky. You may recognize the surname. Uh, I'm sure there is no uh, connection, and it's just, you know, everyone in Ukraine is probably called that, but yeah. It's, in, in case you don't know, it's a lot like Khrushchev, who was the Soviet leader in uh, 1953 to 58, I believe, or something, or 60-something. Um, and they have a little tiny focus tree, but it doesn't do too much. And uh, unfortunately, Ukraine, Ukraine isn't the best country, but I'm sure that eventually Ukraine will be the best country. Amazing. Um, yeah, you get to do administrative reform. At some point, um, there's, there's two options down here. Now, I'm not sure if this is actually possible to... Um, to prevent the October Revolution, because at this point we are starting to get into July and uh, August, and bad things will start happening to the Republic as well, because the continuation of the war is turning everyone that had supported the provisional um, Russian government, which wasn't a Republic yet. Um, hmm. Red Guards. Um, more towards... Uh, the Bolsheviks, because they, again, represented opposition to war. Uh, at some point, if we can apparently survive with the left coalition, we can say, all power to the Soviets, which is... Mm, really, only the Bolsheviks were saying that. But in this case, it's going to switch us over to the Mensheviks, which is like the radical socialists. Uh, or, sorry, social democrats. Uh, because the ideology in this is like... Radical socialism is like the furthest left, which is... Anarchists, populist, leftists, all that shit. Uh, then there's communists, so that's the Bolsheviks. Then there's social democrats, that's the Mensheviks. Social liberal, liberals, that's the right SRs. Uh, liberalism, that's the constitutional democrats. Conservatism, that's the Octoberists. Then we have monarchists, who are called authoritarianism. Then we have paternalism, which is uh, the patriotic union of the fatherland um, led by a guy called Vasily Grigorievich Arlov no idea who he is or what that party is then you have the union of the Russian people Vladimir Purshkievich these are the black hundreds that we were talking about and then you have national syndicalism uh, aka the Nazis apparently uh, that's Boris Savinkov the union of social uh, socialist revolutionaries maximalists um yeah so great uh wait what is it called in uh, yeah national syndicalism whatever uh so that's that and um in the rep in the republic path well you can either ch get the soviet republic and have the mensheviks um and you know glorious <laughs> which uh then uh goes down and uh you can get power to the Soviets, then you can choose the uh, Proclaim the Republic, which eventually will be done in real life as well, uh, which leads down to power to the Parliament. It can also be done by having the Karnilov coup succeed, and having Karnilov in power, and sort of quote-unquote restoring order, and uh, ta then taking Ru Ruski Tsintsinat, uh, Russian Cincinnatus, and giving up power and uh, saying hello, uh, you know, um, let's give power to the parliament. Then, um, 
Then you can have the uh, sort of war dictatorship, you know, uh, war junta, which is going to be him, you know, keeping power with, uh, you know, I guess a council of generals. Then you have the Russian Caesar, which is going to be, I guess, him taking power, you know, by himself and restoring Tsarism. Because here, power goes to the leader, Vajdiu, and, um, and here, power goes to the Tsar, Vlast Tsariu. Uh, then down here you have the question. So this is the question of uh, power. Then the question of land and the question of Russia. Land in the left goes to the country, so socialization, strania. Uh, in the in the middle to the parliament it goes to the peasants, zimlio christianum, uh, which is actually what the what the Bolsheviks ended up partially doing. Then Stalin came in and collectivized everything, but at the beginning it was sort of distributed among the peasants. Uh, then Substvienniku, uh, which is, I believe, like, um, you know, property owner, like, you know, to the, to the owners, really. Uh, or to Pamieshiku, uh, which is another type of um, ownership, but it's basically like um, the kind of Russian landlordism that had also serfdom and, you know, all that bad shit. Uh, so essentially this is like market economy, while this one is just like, yeah, feudalism sounds fun. Uh, then there is the question of peace, uh, miru, mir, so peace, for peace, for peace's sake, uh, miru pabiedu, peace for victory. Um, so if you're, you know, extreme to the right, you're gonna try to continue the war to the end while the left, quote unquote left or center, is gonna be trying to make peace with Germany, which initiates events for ceasefire. Um, then at the end, you can either choose uh, Russia as a commonwealth, so as a like federation of, you know, Soviets, Russia Federation, so the Russian Federation, Russia United, uh, so unitary state, Novaya Russia, New Russia, so the empire of the workers and peasants, uh, the realm of the workers and, pe and peasants. Uh, all this is pretty much Kerensky's fantasy. Now, uh, there is supposed to be the events for... Oh, no, I don't want to save the game. I don't want to save the game. I want to load the game. Now, there is supposed to be all those events, but they've actually not... I've played through this a couple of times. Um... And I actually wasn't able to get the Kornil of coup because something happens that's not supposed to happen, and I'm gonna show you show it to you right now. So essentially, this is 29th of July, 1917, and uh, another important event, the next important event, happens in August. This is even before the Kornil of coup, the Kornil of Shina, as it's known in Russian. It is the August um, sort of uprising of the Bolsheviks. Now, this is a very confusing event, and I don't understand it either, so I will not try to explain it to you. But essentially, some say a spontaneous uprising of pro-Bolsheviks happens in Petrograd. So, you know, to continue the revolution and finish it as a socialist revolution. Uh, we get to... Um, like, a bunch of armed people are storming, you know, Petrograd, all that kind of stuff. We get two options. So, either... Uh, which is... It means something like... Uh, in... Like, any... There's, there's no chance, you know... In, in any case, there's no chance. Just leave everything be, essentially. Like... I f that's how I understand that sentence. Um, and uh, what happens then is the event August Revolution happens and you turn over, uh, you know, you have like the Bolsheviks take over the Winter Palace and everything. It's, you know, you, you turn red. The other one is Abyevit Vayenne Palazhenie de la Sashiti Revolutie. So, um, essentially, uh, take. Um, like just, you know, take any, um, any method, or, well, whatever, take any measure necessary, any position, like war position, like, 
fighting positions to defend the revolution. So you're supposed to be trying to fight it. And um, now this is supposed to, like in real life, you know, the uprising fails and, you know, the Bolsheviks are set back a little bit. And then there's the Karnilov affair, which is when essentially, uh, because at this point, like the Petrograd Soviet is uh, sort of at odds with the government, understandably, because a lot of people from the Petrograd Soviet and supporters of that are participating in an armed attempt to destroy the government. But when Karnilov comes around and you tries to use the army to destroy the provisional government, huh? It might be because I'm the right wing government. Let's see. Let's see if it works differently by doing. Hmm. I wonder if it would be different, but whatever. Whatever, let's try this. So we're gonna take take up fighting positions to defend the revolution. Let's see what happens. Uh, now, all the times that I've tried this, yeah, this might be because because I was the I was the Lvov government, which um, oh the the Finnish parliament wants to secede. Let's arrest them. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, so as you can see now, Ukraine's a bit bigger. Um, from before, from what we saw. And it's gonna get, get even bigger, and bad things are gonna start happening all over. Oh yeah, the August Revolution. Hmm. I'm gonna have to try to play this around a little bit differently and choose the uh, left-wing government from the beginning, because that might change around the way events work, actually. Because a lot of the... A lot of the Karnilov affair stuff was revolving around Kerensky and not Lvov, so... Yeah, that's... That might be a thing. Anyway, we're gonna get the the August Revolution anyway, as you saw. Like, even though it was supposed to be the opposite. So now we are the Rasiskaya Sovietskaya Federativnaya Socialistiskaya Respublika. The Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. And um, now, it's really fun to play for, actually, because it's kind of terrifying, because at this point, what's gonna happen is, let's actually let the game run for a while. So as you can see, you lose all of your bloody leaders. Uh, and you're gonna have to replace. Bliet. You're gonna have to replace all of them, and, uh, yeah. So, here we go. Revolution has happened. Hey, look, it's a lot of people that we know, but they're all young. Simeon Budyonny, Alexander Yegorov, Klimient Varashilov, Grigory Kulik. These are all the people that would end up forming the Soviet army later on and being important. Mikhail Tukashevsky. Look at how young he was, motherfucker. Uh, oh, I wonder who that guy is. Um, certainly no one in porn, just some, um, just some bank robber, uh, and Mikhail Frunze. And, uh, you've got other field marshals, you've got Sergei Kamenev, who I believe has no relations to the other Kamenev. Then you have Lev Trotsky, and I get the feeling that whoever's making this mod doesn't like Trotsky too much, because, fucking hell, one skill? Like, holy shit. Uh, probably haven't read enough about the Russian Revolution. Uh, the guy wasn't shabby at commanding. Uh, then uh, we can put Budyonny, who, well, wasn't maybe exactly the best commander ever. Uh, commanding our cavalry. Even though at this point in the war, Budyonny is just like, just like some random sergeant commanding some cavalry unit at some point. So you get a bunch of events about the Soviet Revolution now. And this is where the real game begins, because a bunch of people are gonna start to rise up against the Soviet government because they don't like it. Um, now, there's another reason why I wanted to get uh, another outcome with like the Kornilov coup and going up to October to get the, Oct or sorry, to November, to 7th of November to get the uh, October Revolution. It's because in, um, with the August Revolution, the, um, Constituent Assembly is accepted by the Soviets, which is, well, uh, kind of a derpy little subject that we're not going to get into because it's complicated as fuck. Just know that it's not as, uh, ha as it happened in real life. Anyway, this is important. Well, that doesn't have any text, but it's really fucking important. Decret a postepennom sakrashenni chislenosti armi. 
decree about on the um, sort of gradual uh, reduction of the army numbers of the army. Yeah, of the army. Do you say effectives in English? I don't know. Um, which is going to start to demobilize our units. Now, our units are um, actually very, very uh, intelligently structured in the mod. Because there's a bunch of, um, like, there's a bunch of these divisions that are effectively just all the same infantry divisions. You know, 7-2 with engineers and artillery support. So, you know, just a normal division. Uh, except, Pichonia Divisia Priziva, um, hmm, I wonder how you say that. Um, this is a David Sot. I have no idea how you're gonna say that in Russian. Goda. So, um, basically, this is the infantry division of uh, the 1900 call to arms of the conscription levies. So, essentially, these are all the people that were 18 or 17 or 20 or whatever it was in Tsarist Russia in 1900. Uh, so actually right now they're pretty old. It's like people that have been recalled to fight the war. Uh, in here, you're gonna, like, just... So basically, uh, one of the main aims of the of the Bolsheviks was to end the war. And, you know, they do that with the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. But these things aren't instant, like in Hearts of Iron, where you have just a, you have a, uh, you know, ceasefire that is signed... And it's just instantly white peace and everyone goes back to normal, you know, stops, automatically stops shooting at each other and everyone's still a soldier. No, what happens is, while people are talking, there might be still fighting, people are breaking ceasefires, fucking weird shit's going on, a commander perhaps is a Rambo guy and wants to kill everything. So the fighting still goes on. It's just that we're gonna get a uh, national spirit after we take, uh, where is it? Uh, which is, let's start peace negotiations, which is going to give us uh, peace negotiations with Germany. It's going to give us a national spirit and Germany a national spirit, which heavily decreases attack. So it's like supposed to not have things that are going on. But at the same time, the Bolsheviks are demobilizing the army because it's exploding anyway. And so we're gonna be bleeding men and equipment while everyone is fighting like less effectively, but they're still fighting all along the front. And that's why I say that it's kind of fun to play because it's not a situation that you get to normally experience in Hearts of Iron, just like complete fucking collapse of everything. And it's done through these events. Uh, like, you know, uh, if you were playing as Tsarist Russia, Russia, you'd see this because like at the beginning, your troops fight right, like relatively well, they're all relatively equipped. But then things start to get bad, and you get to, you know, worse and worse national spirits, and so it starts to get bad. So yeah, there we go. We, de we demobilize some stuff, and also we lose equipment. Minus 10% of all our equipment. Because, um... Yeah, as you can see, we lost a bunch. Uh, because essentially, the people that are being demobilized, they're taking their rifles with them. I have no idea why, because I never read about it in, like, any history book or anything. But I'm guessing it's, like... Yeah, whatever, I'm just gonna keep my rifle to shoot at some ducks or something. Who knows? So then we get the second um, Congress of the Soviets. Now, the Soviets were a dual power structure to the, you know, uh, to the government, so they also had their own Congresses, and it's just complicated, we're not gonna go into it. It's a new way of revolution. This is a new, you know, turn in the development of our revolution. Um, so basically, basically now you're the Bolsheviks, and shit starts to go bad. Let's check out exactly how. Let's check out exactly how. In the meantime, that all this is going on, you're still fighting the Germans. Uh, I have chosen this place to save over here. There's a reason. Uh, I called it Civil War because... Uh, well, when it's uh, 1st of January 1918, so it's kind of, you know, uh, a cool little point. It's like one year from... Um, one year from... Um, re... I hate things. Um, 
I'm a retard. One year from the start of the of the game, and um, also there's a bunch of things that have already happened. So this is as far as I've gotten, and uh, there's probably going to be even more uprisings. But as you can see right now, the Russian Empire has been fairly gutted already. Uh, so what has happened? Uh, we have had the peace negotiations with Germany go through, and Brest-Litovsk has been signed. Um, the Germans have the the Germans demand a united uh, Baltic sort of duchy. Yes, that glorious thing from Kaiserreich is actually real. Um, so the independence of these countries, quote unquote, independence from these country of these countries from um, from Russia, then Lithuania, then they take over a bunch of uh, White Ruthenia, which has its own weird shit going on that we're not gonna get into. Then Ukraine, by this point, has declared independence. The Rada has declared independence. Um, supported by the Germans, but sometimes not. And then it gets weird. Then there's a Polish kind of um, weird independence council under Germany uh, that you know is supposed to provide the manpower and supplies to Germany to fight. Um, and uh, to help control Ukraine. Then you have uh, um, just a bunch of, um, you know, disgregations of power locally uh, for the Russian Soviet Republic. Because at this point, at, like at the beginning, when they declared the Russian Soviet Republic, uh, Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, they're just in power essentially in Petrograd, Moscow, everything in between, a few railway lines here and there, Tula, uh, and a few cities in the south where they have instituted Soviet power and, you know, they have the workers and the peasants have emulated what happened in Petrograd and Moscow. And a few cities and, you know, in the interior, such as Kazan, blah, 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 blah. Uh, however, like most of the government in other cities stays, you know, with the same bureaucratic apparatus as the provisional government. Why? Because the Soviet structure in those places, the dual power structure wasn't as developed. And so essentially these Soviets are weaker than in Moscow and Petrograd and, you know, the Northwest in general. So while in the Northwest, the Soviet government, obviously also from proximity to their capitals, can maintain control in the periphery of the Russian Empire, you know, sort of anti-Bolshevik forces start to rise up, secede, mutiny, army coups bunch of bad shit starts to happen. So, first thing that happens is these uh, these little weird khanates become independent. Then there's a Turkestan rising, which becomes a Soviet Republic, but then becomes a um, becomes an independent thing. Then there's the Alash Autonomy. You may recognize, you know, name and flag from Kaiserreich, which is, you know, a Central Asian rising. Uh, then, um, there is the Far East Cossacks from the um, far, uh, from the Chinese Eastern Railway and uh, Chita uh, under Ataman Semyonov. The Zaybaikalskoye Kazachi Voisko, the um, sort of Transbaikal Cossack host, which is, uh, rises up. Uh, obviously, you have the Ukraine People's Republic, which starts to fight with the Ukrainian Soviet Republic, or the Ukrainian uh, People's Republic of Soviets. Um, which is established to support uh, the Russian Federative Soviet Socialist Republic. And notice how they're actually not our puppet. They're, like, aligned with us. But, uh, you know, if uh, if they win their civil war against Ukraine, because, yes, this is a civil war within a civil war, because I love the Russian civil war. It's fucking amazing. Uh, <laughs> then uh, they're going to join us. If not, we're going to have to kill Ukraine and a bunch of weird shit is going to happen in Ukraine. Then there's the Odessa Soviet Republic, obviously from, you know, very big center of Odessa. And then in the south, there's the two first big white army risings. There is the uh, sort of the Don, uh, sort of Don uh, troop movement, whatever the fuck you want to call it. This is called Oblast Vyska Donskava, so the region of Dawn troops. Um, not 100% sure what it used to be called in real life, but I don't know. It's it's led by Alexei Kalyedian, 
uh, they do have their own unique focus tree. Now, uh, th the reason why I said that this mod is focused on the Russians of war is that these Russian Civil War people, except for a few, have like their own focus trees. Um, a lot of them, but not all of them. Mostly the warlords. And at the end, like the big one is the Vremenoye Sibirskoye Pravitestvo. The um, sort of um, uh, provisional Siberian government. And uh, one of the reasons why this is important is because this is where the Czechoslovak Legion is, controlling the Trans-Siberian Railway. And this is like the main sort of white movement that people are going to be uh, knowing about because they first host a, uh, well, uh, pro-provisional uh, government, government, and then later on, this is where Kolchak comes around. And also because they can be... Uh, they can like either try to go for a Siberian sort of independence or a crusade against Bolshevism, and um, <laughs> look at the look at all of those uh, effects. This is actually really really cool. Uh, this is the mobilization of the Siberian army. Then you have a bunch of things. You can either have um, a free-sided agreement with I'm guessing Japan and. Uh, who else? Who knows? Uh, and that allows Japan to enter your territory, essentially. And you can also enter Japan's territory, and Japan loves you. Or a uh, allied intervention, which is, I believe, what happens IRL, but then, hold on. The Japanese aren't involved. Hmm. Anyway, uh, and the, the allies get, this Russian man is fighting for freedom, and, uh, you know, they can get support either from the Allies or the Japanese, essentially. Uh, then more bad things are going to happen in the Far East, most likely. And so, um, yeah, at this point, you can probably see that we don't have an army like we used to. We all have these guys who are the Krasnarmieskaya uh, Divizia, the Red Army's division. Yeah. Um, essentially, these are Red Guards. Uh, that have risen up to support the revolution, but all of the army that used to exist have been uh, disbanded. And uh, now we have to rebuild our army from scratch and fight the White Army. Now, other important factions are uh, the Volunteer Army, down here, the Provolcheskaya Armia. And right now the leader is Lavr Karnilov, who in real life right now I think would be sitting in like a prison or something. I think. Right? Or he might have escaped or something. I don't remember. This, this whole thing is difficult. Wow. That's a lot of division speed. Um, yeah, like, every one of these guys get, uh, like, a really serious um, buff. All these white army risings get a really serious buff to start to fight you. Um, then there's also the just insanity in the Caucasus. Um, there's the Baku Commune, then there's Abkhazia, which is a Soviet Republic, and they're fighting against the Transcaucasian thing, Zakavkavsky Commissariat, the, the commissar, the, you know, Transcaucasian um, uh, Commissariat, and at the beginning Armenia's part of it as well, but then they go away, then they start to fight Turkey, then Turkey starts to fight everyone, then Azerbaijan probably allies with Turkey, Georgia probably allies with uh, Germany. Georgia, by the way, is uh, under the Mensheviks, the Social Democrats, and uh, yeah, just bad things start to happen. Um, the British are also involved in the area because they have their own troops in Persia. And uh, yeah, uh, just essentially from here, it's downhill and you're gonna have to reunite uh, the country. Now there's also, ooh. That's wrong. There's also supposed to be a meter up there. Let's see if we can get it. And after that, I'm gonna be uh, signing off. So I will be doing actually a series on this. Just, um, I'll be doing it from the revolution onward because I feel like the, the experience of, you know, from the revolution uh, to the Brest-Litovsk is just a very unique thing that I've never seen done in uh, Hearts of Iron. So, yeah. And I'll try to see uh, how things go differently if you elect the, or elect, if you choose um, 
the Kerensky path for the Republic, if you can get actually the Karnilov coup and uh, um, then the October Revolution rather than the August Revolution. Because I feel like things are going to go a little bit more quote unquote historically accurate <laughs> if we go with the actual October Revolution. And so that I have a. Fuck. Right. No, never mind. And so that I actually have an excuse to title the first video of the series October Revolution, which is going to give me more views. No. There's supposed to be a meter up here that I saw called uh, World Revolution Meter, <laughs> which starts off at 1%. And I do not know what it does, but I just wanted to show it off because it's ominous. It's great. World revolution. Let's kill all the capitalists and all the all the empires, all the barons, all the landlords. Anyway, uh, so yeah, this is essentially the mod. Um, I will be leaving the links down in the description, all useful stuff. And now I'll go back and uh, load up, back up the save, and try to um, see if things can play out differently and if I can get the October Revolution, and uh, you'll see more of this in the future on my channel. So thank you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you soon, and have a good day.